Welcome to worship on the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. My name is Pastor Seth Novak, and on behalf of the entire congregation of Anya State Lutheran Church, I'd like to thank you for being a part of this worship service today. Our building may be closed, but our church is still open. You can download a bulletin with the order of service from the link in the video description below. Before we begin our worship, I'd like to share some prayer concerns with the community. I'll invite you to share any prayer concerns you may have now either in the chat or in the comment section being mindful of the privacy in this public space today we remember in prayer the Baber family uh, following wendy's death this past week um, the family has held a private memorial service but we continue to pray for consolation in this time of shock and grief for for them and for all of us uh, this was very unexpected for many of us audrey clinton also asks excuse me, asks for prayers for Don's son, Dave, who recently experienced the return of his cancer. And uh, also this week, we remember with Thanksgiving two Lutheran church musicians, Carl Schock and Scott Wiedler, who died this last weekend. Both men have had a lasting effect on the music in the Lutheran church through Schock's many hymns and anthems in preparation for the green LBW hymnal, and Wiedler's work as program director for worship and music in the ELCA produced the current red ELW hymnal and many other resources. We are all blessed because of the life's work of these two musicians. I'll invite you to turn now to your bulletin as we begin our worship. <clears throat> we gather in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed, clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit, 
and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our reading today is from 1 Corinthians 8, uh, 1 through 13. Now concerning food sacrifice to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge but anyone who loves God is known of him. Hence, as to eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, uh, there, uh, there is, uh, in fact, uh, many gods, many lords, Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, 
might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the Sabbath, the synagogue, and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not like the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's been a few weeks now since we read the story of Jesus' baptism, but Mark's Gospel wants us to know that we are still telling the same story. Jesus is baptized, and the Holy Spirit descends on him. Then immediately, Mark says, the Spirit sends him into the wilderness to be tempted. When he comes back, he calls his first disciples and takes them to Capernaum, where he immediately begins teaching on the Sabbath. And immediately, a man shows up with an unclean spirit. Once Jesus casts that spirit out, the news immediately spreads throughout all of Galilee. These are not just a bunch of, in, of unconnected events. They're all a series of related incidents, all resulting from that first incident, Jesus' baptism. <clears throat> At the Jordan, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus. But where did it go from there? It didn't leave. It remained with him. It possessed him, you could say. And we don't tend to think of possession in those terms, but then we don't really think of possession at all outside of horror movies, do we? In the world of Mark's gospel, Jesus was possessed by the Holy Spirit at his baptism. Which is why, when the man possessed by an unclean spirit enters the synagogue, Jesus can't escape confrontation. Holy and unclean meet face to face, and a spiritual cage match of sorts ensues. We tend to celebrate baptism as a relatively quiet and mundane affair, but Jesus' baptism is anything but quiet and mundane. His baptism doesn't allow him to blend in with everybody else. Instead, it sends him into direct confrontation with them. Mark tells us that the people in the synagogue at Capernaum were astounded, which could mean that they were all terribly impressed, but it could just as likely mean that they were simply terrified. When the man comes forward to confront Jesus, the question he asks is telling. Have you come here to destroy us? And I've always kind of assumed that the us referred to the unclean spirits and the demons that were possessing people. But what if us was intended to refer instead to the synagogue, to their simple community and their traditional worship? I wonder if that unclean spirit in the text is not a demon in the classical sense, not some evil supernatural power from hell, but that it is demonic in the sense that it is opposed to God and God's reign. It might be that that unclean spirit is the sense of the way we've always done it, that Jesus disturbed, that Jesus came in order to disturb, that by following the call of his baptism and teaching about the reign of God, he's stirring things up. We sometimes read these biblical stories about demon possession as primitive stories of mental illness, 
assuming that ancient people were too superstitious or naive to identify what we can now easily explain. But reading the story in this way allows us, uh, allows those of us who have decided that we are not mentally ill to let ourselves off the hook. It allows us to forget that we ourselves are unclean before God, that we too need God to exercise from us the attitudes and the loyalties that keep us from joyfully following Jesus' call to participate in the hope of God's kingdom. It would appear that it is us, not the ancients, but us, who are too superstitious and naive to grasp what the story is actually about, that it's about all of us. Jesus' baptism drives him into direct and noisy confrontation with the good church-going people of Capernaum. His teaching is controversial, but it's not crazy. <clears throat> it has authority, authority that cannot be denied when Jesus casts out that unclean spirit. This is what Jesus meant when he said he came not to bring peace, but a sword. There is no room in God's kingdom for the demonic powers of the world and the human heart that are fundamentally opposed to God's reign because they are too comfortable with the status quo, with the way we've always done it. Part of Jesus' baptismal vocation is to confront and drive out those powers and to make way for God's kingdom. In the baptism we all share with him, Jesus also calls us to proclaim the good news of Christ in word and deed and to strive for peace and justice in all the earth. Like Jesus, we also are called to exorcise the demonic powers that resist God's reign of wholeness and healing. We might imagine that means that we're called to be prophets like Jesus, all going into synagogues and casting out demons and teaching with authority. That sounds good on paper, but it's good for us also to remember that none of us is Jesus. Yeah, we're the body of Christ, but we're the body of Christ together. The truth is, we can't just go around declaring what the will of God is because very often we don't know. We don't need to look very hard to see that there are a lot of different Christian traditions in the world that teach a lot of different things. There are a lot of Christians who believe a lot of different things. The church is divided on all kinds of issues, ranging from the response to racism, to the acceptance of uh, LGBTQIA folks, to gun, gun control, to abortion, to care for creation. What seems, excuse me, what clearly seems like God's will to some appears evil and demonic to others. It's easy for us to begin wondering who among us is speaking words commanded by God and who is speaking a word that God has not commanded. <clears throat> In the face of this ambiguity, it's a lot easier just to keep quiet, to leave the hard and often dangerous work of proclaiming the good news and striving for peace and justice to those who are called to be prophets. We'd rather not risk upsetting all those good church-going people around us by saying something that might be unpopular. <coughs> what this means in practice is that most of us keep silent while the loudest and the brashest among us fight themselves. What it means is that, that same unclean spirit entraps us, causes us to wonder, has he come to destroy us? Christ has called each of us through our baptism to be a part of God's kingdom. God wants us to be proclaiming and striving, but we sometimes forget that Christ does not call us to these things alone. We are also called in our baptism to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to love and serve all people following the example of Jesus. Part of fulfilling our baptismal calling is to do this work together and to discern what that work is together. Like Jesus, that will lead us into controversy and confrontation it may even mean some noisy showdowns in the middle of worship sometimes. But it also means that when we disagree with one another, 
We disagree not as enemies, but as siblings. People born of the same spiritual parentage, washed in the same baptism, members of the same community, each of us following the same Jesus, even if we disagree about how. God doesn't call us first and foremost to be correct, but to be active. We may not always get it right the first time, but that's why we practice confession and forgiveness within this community of God so that we can learn and grow into a fuller understanding together of God's will. We're mistaken when we think that salvation is an individual thing. God intends salvation to be communal. That means that all those different ideas and different perspectives that exist within the church are not only acceptable, but actually, maybe, that they're the way God wants it to be. We're not saved by doing or believing the right things, but by striving for greater love. We all need one another. Left and right, extreme and moderate, loud and quiet, confident and doubtful. God calls all of us into community together so that we can push and pull one another, so we can rein each other in and egg each other on. We are baptized into a community so that that community can shape us and so that we can shape that community. In our confrontations, in our disagreements, in our conflicts, love is our starting point and also our destination. We may know lots of things. We may know how right we are and how logical our own position is, but as St. Paul says, knowledge puffs up. It's love that builds up. In love, we are called to listen to one another, to talk together, to grow together. In love, we are all swept along into the imminent and inexorable reign of God. We're not always going to agree on what God is calling us to, but we are called to move forward together. As Martin Luther puts it, we are called to sin boldly and to trust even more boldly in Christ, that he will continue to cast out those unclean spirits from among us that tell us not to rock the boat, to keep our heads down and be quiet. As we continue to work for God's kingdom, we do so in confidence, following where Christ calls us, repenting where we must, forgiving where we can, but always trusting that with Jesus at the head, our next step will always take us in the right direction, that we will end up where God wants us to be.
with the whole people of God in Christ Jesus. Let us pray for the church and those in need and all of God's creation. For the whole church, its ministry, and the mission of the gospel. For the well-being of creation. for peace and justice in the world, the nations and those in authority, and our local community. For the poor, oppressed, sick, bereaved, lonely, for all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. For Agnus Day and for the people closest to us, for the faithful departed, into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. When we were in darkness, the light of the world came into our midst. The feast and the season of Epiphany celebrate the coming of that light among us in the person of Jesus, who shows us the way to abundant life. One of the ways we experience and continue to share that abundant life is through the ministries of this congregation. As members and friends of Agnus Day, we gather to support one another in loving community. We worship together in the hope of healing for this pandemic and beyond we lift up our neighbors through programs like Fish Food Bank and Food Backpacks for Kids and the Peninsula Gig Harbor Homelessness Coalition. We nurture the faith of Christians of all ages through forums in cross-generational Sunday school and confirmation classes. All of this and so much more is made possible by your generous contributions to the budget and outreach of this congregation. If you would like to join me in making sure that these ministries continue to grow during this time of pandemic, you can follow the link in the video description below to make a one-time donation or to set up a recurring gift to Anya's Day. Thank you for your dedication both to this community and to this work to which God has called us.
as we prepare our hearts for Holy Communion, please join me in prayer. Blessed are you, O God, creator of heaven and earth. You rescued your covenant people, led them on all their journeys, and taught them by the prophets. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that whoever believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he'd given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on this meal, O God, and make us one in this community of faith and with your people throughout the world. Glory and praise to you, O God, author of life, word made flesh, power of the Most High, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you're not receiving the meal this morning, then receive this blessing. May you abide in the love of Christ this day and all days. Amen. If you are receiving the meal this morning, hear these words of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is abundant and eternal. Amen.
Let us pray. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet, nourished in body and in spirit, to proclaim your good news and serve others in your name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Before we conclude, I'd like to share just a few announcements. First, uh, next week, February 7th, our forum topic will be on the church's role in society, uh, which I think will be interesting, but the real value of that morning will be in practicing a method of having a conversation as a congregation about uh, how and what we say to the community around us. <clears throat> I use the sermon time next week to introduce this topic, and then we'll discuss it following the worship in the forum, which means that um, next week on the 7th, our forum will be after worship at 1030, and our fellowship will be before worship starting at 9 o'clock. Um, that's a change just for next week only. Then the following week on February 14th, I will discuss, uh, or I will use the sermon time to uh, proclaim what we together as a congregation have discussed during the forum. So I hope you'll join us for that and be a part of our communal discerning what we have to say to the world about this topic. Also, on February 17th, which is coming up very quickly, uh, we'll be gathering for Ash Wednesday worship on YouTube at 7 p.m. Our midweek Lent worship service will be offered twice, uh, twice during the day following that, every Wednesday, once at 11 a.m. and once at 7 p.m. Both times we will gather on Zoom with St. John's Episcopal Church for a pre-recorded worship service, followed by a presentation and discussion. The theme for our gatherings this year will be on addressing the healing, excuse me, addressing and healing the divisiveness in our society and within our own families, uh, using the lives of the saints as a model for our witness. There's a lot of uh, division and polarization right now, and a lot of us are wondering what we can do about that. And so we hope that this will be an opportunity for us to explore that. <clears throat> Father Eric Stell and I will be taking turns leading these presentations and discussions. Um, that'll happen every Wednesday. It'll be the same thing both at 11 and 7, so uh, the idea is that you can come whenever is most convenient for you. Uh, this Doing this online opens us up to being able to do stuff not just in the evening, and so we want to see um, when that works best for folks. I hope you mark your calendars for February 24th through March 24th and plan to join us on those days if you can. Finally, just a reminder that we do still have plenty of hymnals available to be loaned out if you're interested. Just call or email the office and we can arrange a time for you to come by and sign one out. Or we can um, arrange for one to, to make it to you if you're unable to come to us. These are a great resource to have at home. Not only are they full of favorite hymns, of course, that you can sing, but um, orders of uh, prayer for morning, evening, and night, as well as a daily lectionary of Bible readings to help you guide you in your devotions, as well as the entire book of Psalms and Martin Luther's small catechism for devotional use, and a plethora of prayers for all occasions. As we look ahead to Lent, it may prove very useful depending on uh, which spiritual practice you choose. Once again, thank you for being a part of this worship service today. If you found today's service meaningful, Please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can gather right here with On You Stay for worship every Sunday at 9.45 a.m. I'd also like to invite you to make On You Stay a part of your week. On Wednesday, the weekly text study will be meeting at 10 a.m. to look at the lessons for the coming Sunday, and the Knitters group will meet at 1.30 p.m. You can find links to these Zoom gatherings and other activities happening among and beyond our congregation in the events tab on our website, onyoustaylutheran.org. Go in peace. Shine with the light of Christ. Amen. I'd like to invite you to share the peace of Christ with someone you know with a call or a text or an email or by sharing the link to this video on your social media so that you can worship together. God bless you in your week.